Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Paul Norgate as my partner in crime this evening for talking about conscious and auteur. And we're gonna kick off with Paul um, and then he'll hand over to me, but I'm gonna be operating the slide. So um, let me just bring those up and I'll hand it over to you, Paul. Thank you, Jane. Morning, evening. Here we go. From the beginning. So conscious is our first one. And I have to say to start with, I was rather pleased to find this picture, which has the blankets and the bed and the nurse and in the top right hand corner, the flowers. So that was, um, that was a plus point before I'd even started. Okay, next one, please, Jay. So for reasons which will become apparent, I'm actually going to read not the version that Sitwell published, but Stallworthy's 1983. And we'll, we'll come back to the Sitwell in a moment, if that's okay with everybody. So, conscious. His fingers wake and flutter up the bed. His eyes come open with a pull of will, helped by the yellow mayflowers by his head. The blind cord draws across the window sill. What a smooth floor the ward has. What a rug. Who's that talking somewhere out of sight? Three flies are creeping round the shiny jug. Nurse? Doctor? Yes, all right, all right. But sudden evening blurs and fogs the air. There seems no time to want a drink of water. Nurse looks so far away. And here and there, music and roses burst through crimson slaughter. He can't remember where he saw blue sky. The trench is narrower, cold. He's cold yet hot. And there's no light to see the voices by. There's no time to ask. He knows not what. Next, please, Jane. So the first thing I think that we, we might notice with Conscious is that clearly this is one of those poems where Owen has at least in mind something by Sassoon. And of course, uh, many of you will know Sassoon's poem, The Deathbed. Um, Owen was clearly bowled over by it. I mean, virtually before he'd even met um, Sassoon, he'd been reading The Old Huntsman and he picked out The Deathbed as his favourite. This is his letter to Leslie Gunston, uh, in which he describes his very first meetings with Sassoon. And he says, <coughs> excuse me, he says, I'm going to send you a copy of this. The deathbed, he says, is the finest poem. And he says, I told Sassoon that, it's my opinion. And rather smugly, he says, it is his own opinion, that it. So his opinion agrees with mine. Okay, next please, Jane. Uh, if you don't know the deathbed, it is virtually the same uh, situation at the basis of it as, as Owens. This is the soldier who is in bed in a hospital or casualty clearing station. These are just a few lines uh, which give you a flavour of it. He drowsed and was aware of silence heaped round him, unshaken as the steadfast walls. Someone was holding water to his mouth. He swallowed unresisting, moaned and dropped through crimson gloom to darkness. Night, with a gust of wind, was in the ward, blowing the curtain a glimmering curve. Well, Sassoon's poem is actually considerably longer than that, but I think there's enough there to show you uh, that uh, it's very likely indeed that Owen had this in mind. Okay, next please, Jane. And there is that one particular detail in Owen's letters. This is from his time at uh, 13th Casualty Clearing Station in May, 1917. Uh, you recall that he'd had a particularly bad time in April and March. Uh, I think it was March when he fell down that well and virtually concussed himself and was at 13th CCS for the first time. And then after the time near St. Quentin and the railway embankment, he was back there in May. Um, still protesting to his mother and his family that he was okay. So I have superb weather, 
socially possible friends, great blue bowls of yellow mayflower, baths and bed ad lib. Um, I don't know whether the gardeners among you know what this mayflower is. I looked it up and it told me it was arbutus, but then it said arbutus is pink. So I don't quite know what this is. Perhaps somebody will tell me later on. OK, next, Jane, please. And again, as is often the case with Owen, you can pick out echoes. Um, this line, sudden evening muddles all the air. Something's going wrong in the soldier's consciousness, obviously. But this idea of um, daylight or light turning to darkness goes quite a long way back with Owen. Uh, the Unreturning, a poem from 1912-ish, suddenly night crushed out the day. And from the same year or same period, I uh, remember the episode where he has a fall from his bicycle um, and has a, what he calls a regular syncope. And he describes that as sudden twilight seeming to fall upon the world. And then I just picked out another couple of examples from his wartime poems, the, the sentry who's claiming to see lights when actually everybody else has gone out. And that very striking uh, image from mental cases of sunlight sleem, seems a blood smear, night comes blood black. Next, please, Jane. So this poem is very much, I think, in the mainstream of, of Owen's writing at this period. And again, lots of cross references. Perhaps the most striking line, or one of the most striking lines in it, is that one about music and roses bursting through crimson slaughter. Well, as you probably know, when he was in France before the war, um, he met the French poet Tayad. Um, and what he has a line about les clap mystérieux des roses et du sang, the mysterious, well, brilliance or radiance or glow of roses and blood. Insensibility, having seen all things red, the hurt of the color of blood. And very interestingly, I think a poem from quite late on, uh, Kind Ghosts, which has roses and blood and crimson all together. OK, next one, Jane, please. So essentially, I think what we have is a poem about a point of transition. It's not absolutely clear what the transition is to, whether he's just losing conscience again, consciousness again, or whether he's going to sleep, or whether he's actually dying. Uh, you could interpret any of those, I think. But this sort of binary contrast, awareness and, and dreaming or daydreaming, waking and sleeping, conscious, unconscious, living and dead, I think this is a, a characteristically Owen trope, which you can find repeated uh, in many places. And I think it's interesting too, we'll perhaps come back to this later on, <clears throat> because it, it, it's a way of highlighting a point of transition from one state to another. Now, this is a, a fairly, in one sense, a fairly common and everyday transition. I mean, we all are awake and then we go to sleep. Um, some of us drift off into daydreams um, and more times than we are aware of during the day, but so on. What I find in quite a number of Owen's war poems is, is a dwelling on transitions of one kind or another, which may be accompanied with by a change in the light, but moments where something moves irrevocably from one state to another. Points, for example, like where the soldiers step onto the train in the send-off and everything suddenly the die is cast, no going back. Or that footstep they take in spring offensive, knowing their feet have come to the end of the world. That must be one of the best lines in Owen, I think. Um, but these transitions, we're here again. And obviously, as I said, a lot of it is related in, in many ways to Owen's own experience. I mean, his, his time in the casualty clearing station, he must have experienced moments like this himself. He certainly will have observed it in those around him in the beds in, in the hospital there. Um, he's picked up details like the May Mayflowers in, in, the, in the room itself. If we look back through the poem, there are sort of hints and references perhaps back to his own experience, the, the trench which deepens. I mean, the, the time he spent out in the open near San Quentin in the cold 
it's very much related to his own experience, but somehow it takes us a long way beyond that, I think. Next slide, please, Jane. So having said that, I'd like to go back to the version which uh, I'm sure many of you will have read in the 1920 edition, which is not the same poem. His fingers wake and flutter up the bed, his eyes come open with a pull of will helped by the yellow mayflowers by his head. So far, so good. A blind cord draws across the window sill. How smooth the floor of the ward is. What a rug. And who's that talking somewhere out of sight? Why are they laughing? What's inside that jug? Nurse? Doctor? Yes, all right, all right. But sudden dusk bewilders all the air. There seems no time to drink. Sorry, to want a drink of water, Miss Printer. Nurse looks so far away and everywhere. Music and roses burnt through crimson slaughter. Cold, cold, he's cold and yet so hot. And there's no light to see the voices by, no time to dream and ask. He knows not what. Well, if we can go to the next slide, Jane. The texts that we have come from three manuscripts. One of them, this one, 46 at the bottom there, is clearly a rough draft. You can see there's a lot of alteration there, a lot of scribbles. There's a whole lot of alterations at the bottom of the, um, the sheet. And in the middle of it, a bit of pencil uh, correction. Next one, Jane. This one looks clearly like a fair copy. And it is, in fact, um, a fair copy of all those amendments on the previous one. But there's also a third one. You can have that one, Jane. 45, which is not quite a fair copy. And it's not quite the same poem. So first question from an editor, which one of these do you take? Well, Owen's habit with his drafting was it in, in general what you might call linear. He scribbles something out, then he tinkers with it and crosses out and changes things. And then he does a fair copy onto a next sheet of paper, does the same thing, and it, it progresses in an almost linear way. If we can go to the next slide, Jane. The problem with the version that Sitwell published in 1920 is that for some reason that process is not reflected. Next slide, please, Jane. The first thing we'll notice if we compare the manuscripts with what Sitwell prints is that towards the end of the poem, in the first place, there is a whole line missing. He can't remember where he saw blue sky. Now that line appears unamended in all the drafts, and yet for some reason Sitwell leaves it out. And the following line, as printed by Sitwell, cold, he's cold and yet so hot, there's a foot missing there. That only has four um, iambic feet. So something's going on there. Next slide, please, Jane. Well, there are the three manuscripts, and you can see towards the top of each of them that line, he can't remember where he saw blue sky. In the lower two, 35 and 45, you can see if you read them that that line, more blankets, cold, he's cold and yet so hot, that's okay metrically. The trench is deep, cold, cold and yet so, that one is okay. For some reason, Sitwell has taken the one from the top version, which is the rough draft, only four feet. And the reason you can see why it's only four is because Owen hasn't on that draft, he hasn't decided what he's going to do with the first part of the line. It's, it's all crossings out. So an odd choice there. Next one, please, Jane. Even odder is that if you go through, and I hope the color coding is some help here, uh, but I've keyed it down the right hand side. You can see that the editing here does not follow any one of those three manuscript drafts consistently. It is, in fact, a complete collage of bits and pieces, plus, or to be more accurate, minus the missing line. So the first four lines are straight from manuscript 45, then 35, then a line from the rough draft, then back to 45, then a missing line, and then back to the rough draft to the ending. 
very odd. Next one, Jane. So a few more oddities. That middle line, sudden dusk bewilders all the air. Well, if we can go to the next slide, Jane. Is there not one in between that? Sorry, I should have gone. Go forward again. Um, forward it. still? Um, you, is there one missing? I think I've missed the slide there. So I'm going to hang on a second, Jane. Just give me a second. Apologies for this. Don't vote. worry. No problem. I'll go back to my. That was the one we were on originally. Thank you, fine. Yes, we were right. My mistake. Okay, so next one then, please, Jane. That phrase, dusk bewilders, only appears on one of the manuscripts, and I, I will come back to it. Another issue in the last line, no time to dream. He has no time to ask, is, is what the version in the others. No time to dream, in fact, doesn't appear in Owen's wording in, as such in any of those drafts. Next one. That's the very ending of the poem. And you can see in the last line or so there, there is no time now to ask, he knows not what has been crossed out and amended to, there is no time to ask. And then perhaps even on the screen, you can tell that that is pencil rather than pen, the insertion. There is no time to dream and ask, he knows not what. But Sitwell has printed just no time to dream. Next one, please, Jane. And there it is a little larger, so you can see clearly that dream has been inserted at a different time from the rest of the amendments there. It's in pencil rather than in pen. Okay, next one. If we go back to the first half of the poem, there are a number of other emendations editorially added here. Owen wrote, the blind chord draws, and for some reason that comes out as a blind chord. Owen wrote, what a smooth floor the ward has. Here we have how smooth the floor of the ward is. Owen wrote, who's that talking? Sorry, and who is that? what we have here and who's that talking somewhere out of sight we've got a whole set of, of alterations here next one jane please and there we are the blind chord becomes a what a smooth becomes how smooth who is that becomes and who's that next and then in that key part of the poem that the central line, music and roses burst through crimson slaughter. Burst, somehow, is this a misreading? I don't think so. It, it's an alteration. Music and roses burnt through crimson slaughter. And in the previous line, here and there has somehow become everywhere. Next slide. Next slide. There you go. Nurse looks so far away and here and there, no, and everywhere, says Sitwell. Music and roses burst. Well, I think it would take quite an effort to misread that as burnt, wouldn't it? That is clearly burst. Next one, please, Jane. So what we have in the 1920 version is this collage of chunks from three different manuscripts, plus and I've highlighted these in bold, a series of emendations, which I can only call it editorial. Someone has decided perhaps to improve things. I'm not quite sure what the motivation is here, but this is not what Owen wrote. And it's very unusual, I think, in terms of, I mean, we have seen Sitwell misread 
in other of the poems that we've done in this series, we have seen misreadings, uh, which other editors have, have later corrected. But this is not misreadings, possibly burnt for burst, but the others, something different going on. Can we go to the next slide, Jane? So Edmund London, 10 years later, produces his revised and corrected and extended edition. And you can see from the things that I've highlighted here in red, these Blunden has actually corrected to read as Owen wrote them. So the blind chords are restored, uh, restored, sorry. What a smooth floor, who's that? Sudden evening muddles all the air as opposed to dusk bewildering. Uh, he's completed the um, short line, more blankets, cold, he's cold. He's restored the missing line. Sorry, I didn't highlight that one about the blue sky, the line before that. And he's gone back to Ubbins' version of the last line. But, next slide, in block capitals, uh, just for, so that you can pick them out quickly, he has not amended that almost crucial alteration of burst to burnt. So Blunden's got 95% of the way there, but he hasn't changed that. And in fact, if we go on to the next slide, Jane, what you can see is that, in effect, Blunden is still working from two different manuscripts. Now, Blunden and Sitwell clearly have had access to all the manuscripts. It's not that something's not there. Um, I think it was... Um, Dennis Welland actually did hazard a guess at one point, well, perhaps there was another manuscript somewhere that they'd got, which we don't have anymore. Um, I don't think that's true. I think this is a collage. So Blunden has restored and improved, but he hasn't got there yet. And next slide, Jane. Day Lewis, 63, and Hibbert 10 years later. Well, Dominic obviously was, was hamstrung by um, Harold's awkwardness at this point still. But they still are working with this collage, although they restore the line here and there, Music and Roses, burst. And it isn't until we get to Stallworthy, who I think is the next slide, Jane, who says, I don't quite know what's been going on here. They seem to have been combining manuscripts. But he then chooses to go for the one which has the slight variations. And I think the next slide, yep, there we go. So the line about the jug is different. Three flies are creeping. Here, the evening isn't muddling, it blurs and fogs. And this is the only draft of the three in which the reference to the trench appears. So it's a slightly different poem again, although it has the plus point of being a single uh, manuscript draft that he has transcribed here. And most of the issues that we found in the earlier versions have been corrected. So I'm asking myself, what was going on here? Next slide, please, Jane. Well, that line about sudden dusk bewildering all the air, it only actually appears in that form on one manuscript. And as you can see, rather like that reference to dream, it's been added in pencil. And nothing else has been crossed out. Again, this is not typical Owen. Owen's revisions nearly always are initiated by a crossing out. He doesn't just scribble things idly and, and leave them. He's very clear with himself about what he wants to stand and what he doesn't. This one is odd in that respect. Um, it's clearly been done later because it's pencil rather than pen. And it looks almost, it's smudged. It looks as if somebody might have actually gone over it and decided, am I going to erase this or not? Next slide, please, Jane. And the same with the insertion of dream, that's pencil at the bottom of the page there. That's the same pencil, I think. So this is the same bit of revising going on. Now, can we go to the next slide, Jane, please? What struck me all of a sudden when I was looking at that is the handwriting. 
Is this Owen? Well, dusk bewilders you might almost take as Owen's, but that E formation, the Greek looking E, I don't know what the technical term is, in dream, is very clear there. And you, well, you, you can see several of Owen's E's in the rest of the manuscript there. I, I don't, I'm not aware of Owen using that formulation at all. And if you look closely at bewilders at the top of the page, it's not very clear, but I suspect the E at the beginning of the word is the same formation. Next slide, please, Jane. I've enlarged bewilders at the bottom of the page there, just so you can see it. Owen did actually have it uh, as an option in one of the manuscripts, but as you can see, it's one of about half a dozen options and he's, he's crossed it out. And I can't see the word dusk in there at all. So that formation of bewilders. Well, who's this? This is Sassoon's handwriting. Yes, thank you, Jay. Sassoon consistently uses this E formation. Okay, well, this is a deliberately best version, I think, of Sassoon's uh, handwriting. But that's very striking, I think. And the conclusion I had to come to was that for some reason, out of all the poems that um, Sassu, uh, sorry, that Sitwell had selected to go into the collection, this was one where Siegfried had decided to intervene and do some of his own editing. Now, why he should do that again is, is a, a question. And I can only hypothesize, I think, that it was because he, he was aware of, and well, he obviously talked with Owen about it, but he was aware of how closely Owen's poem reflects his own dreamers. No, sorry, the deathbed, the one that was in that letter earlier on. I told him that I thought it was the best one and, and he agreed with me. Perhaps because of his um, close involvement with this particular um, echo of his own writing, some, in some way or other, Sassoon wanted to try and, I don't know what the charitable term would be, tidy up, sharpen up the poem for Wilfred. Whether, I mean, whether his alterations do that or not, of course, is an entirely different question. Um, and I, I, I don't like to do Siegfried down in, in favour of Wilfred, but I, if you look back at some of the amendments that Siegfried suggested on other texts like Anthem, um, occasionally you think, what? Or I do anyway. I mean, I, there are set, quite a lot of the amendments he suggested to Anthem, which Wilfred didn't bother with at all, and I can see why. Um, so I, I don't always trust Siegfried's attempts to, to re-edit. I'm sure his discussions on the rest of it were very helpful and, and Owen was um, very glad to have them. But anyway, what we have here, I think, is uh, a fascinating little bit of uh, trivia, perhaps, but um, I mean, it's not the greatest poem anyway, um, but I, don't, I can't think, and I, I should be very interested if anybody else can remind me, I can't think of another poem that we've discussed in this collection where um, Sassoon's intervention over and above Sitwell's editing work uh, has been apparent. So there you go, Jane. I think that ought to uh, be a good place to stop and get people to think about um, what they might say. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was amazing and so detailed and just wonderfully and you know clear. That's incredible. Um, should we open it to the floor or should I? talk about Artair next. You, I mean, I think maybe let's, if there's any questions specifically about this, let's maybe address those for a bit and then I'll, I think there's going to be some, there'll be some um, synergies with things. Um, Elizabeth Van Vandiver, you had a raised a hand. Yes, um, Paul, thank you. That was wonderful and I think very persuasive. I agree about um, Sassoon's intervention sometimes being not quite on the money. The one that occurs to me is his suggestion for Dulce at Decorum Est, where he wrote in the gesturing lie, the gesturing mm. instead of the old lie. And thank goodness yeah. Wilfred did not accept that. And what strikes me about that is the gesturing lie would disrupt the meter the same way 
there seems no time to dream and ask he knows not what adds an extra I am into that last line. But what I really wanted to say in response to your final question, is there anywhere else that we know of where Sassoon's intervention shows up in the 1920 edition? Yes, the title of Apologia pro Poemate Meo, which Owen had titled Apologia pro Poema Mea, thinking that poema was a first declension Latin noun feminine, when it's actually a third declension noun taken from Greek and neuter. And Stallworthy says that Sassoon corrected the title. I assume that means corrected the title for publication in the 1920 edition. I don't know where else or when else he could have. He actually says the public school man Sassoon corrected Owen. He does, he does, yes. And so yeah. that's a completely silent intervention where Sassoon is, I think, protecting Owen yeah. by making his Latin correct so that he won't come in for the scorn of the other public school men. But um, so that's one example. And the Sitwell does not in any way indicate that that's not Owen's own title. So I yeah. think that's a parallel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you're right. Obviously, I, that that is a correction. Yes, in, in a yeah. different mode to what he appears to have done with conscious, isn't it? Indeed, indeed. I it's mean, quite changing different. the the blind chord to a blind chord is idiosyncratic in a way, isn't it? I mean, what what difference does it make? It, it, does it is it for the sound? I don't quite know why he's done it, I, and. And of course, the, the, the main difference is with the Latin title, there is an objectively correct version and exactly. an objectively yes. incorrect version. Whereas yeah. with the changes Sassoon has made in Owen's poem, he's really just saying, I think this is better than what you wrote. Not, I think this is, not you wrote something incorrect and I'm fixing it, but I think this is better than what you wrote. So you're right, it is a, it's a completely different category yeah. change, yeah. but it is still a change made by Sassoon. Hmm. I mean, if, I'd, um, I'd be interested. Who, sorry, sorry. I, was, I was just going to say I'd be interested to know if anybody would want to argue for any of those amendments. I mean, is is sudden dusk bewilders all the air significantly better or different to sudden evening muddles all the air, or blurs and fogs, which is or what's blurs and fogs, different. yeah, yeah. Viv, did you want to come Yes, in? Um, I'm afraid this is going off at a tangent a bit, um, but uh, Conscious always reminds me so much of an earlier poem, which is Disabled, because they're both set at that moment of dusk, and the last two lines of Conscious are so like the last two lines of Disabled, how cold and late it is, why don't they come, yes. and put him into bed, why don't they come, and it's so that poem was still there at the back of his mind when he was composing this one. Yes, um, and and that line, nurse, doctor, yes, all right, all right. Why don't they come? Why don't they come? Yes, it is almost identical situation, isn't it? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And of course, we're talking about disabled next time, which is one of my favorites as well. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, well, uh, maybe we should move on to um, Ater, yeah. but um, I could talk about Paul's stuff all evening, and you may want to go back to that, but. Hopefully there'll be a few synergies with what um, what he's had to say, and we can we can bring in the close readings. Um, I admit that I do not have the same um, forensic detail <laughs> that Paul has got into so beautifully. Um, mine's more of a, an overview, but I do look at a few changes, and I think Ater is perhaps a less complicated text in its in the two versions that are available. There are actually other um, drafts in the First World War Poetry Digital Archive, which you can look at. I didn't go through those forensically. I went for the two sort of fair copies. Um, and, um, uh, but certainly because I think that there was one that does represent Owen's at least final version. So, um, those of you who know this know that um, Arter, Arter was written and revised in that period that we tend to call Owen's Annus Mirabilis, um, that is between resuming military service after Craig Lockhart 
um, and his death in 1918. Um, when he was stationed at Scarborough as the camp commandant to the officers of the 5th Reserve Battalion at the Clarence Gardens Hotel, he wrote to his mother, um, oh, hang on one second, I had the wrong, okay, that's the next one, excuse me. He wrote to his mother that this afternoon I had a fire in my grate which smokes horribly in the wind. Thus, I finished an important poem this afternoon in the right atmosphere. Four days later, he wrote to Sassoon, and this is the one that's on the screen now. And I read you the whole letter because I just love the, the way that he uses the language here. Um, my friend, I shall continue to poop off heavy stuff at you. I love that phrase. Till you get my, rain, my range at Scarborough and so silence me for the time. This wild with all regrets was begun and ended two days ago at one gas. If simplicity, if imaginativeness, if sympathy, if resonance of vowels make poetry, I have not succeeded. But if you say, here is poetry, it will be so for me. What do you think of my vowel rhyme stunt in this and vision? Do you consider the hop from flea to soul too abrupt? Wouldn't our theosophists like the thought form of this piece? Quite, um, quite see the origin of theosophy. It's the same as that of heaven and Abraham's bosom and that and of the baby that sucked Abraham's bosom, supposing he li supposing lie lived long enough ago. Desperate desire, your own W-E-O. And I guess we could probably do a whole analysis of that letter on its own. Um, but of course, wild with all regrets, and this is the manuscript of this, becomes Auteur in April 1918 when he's in Ripon. Um, and um, he revises this version of Wild with All Regrets um, into um, that longer poem, which we now know. Um, and he revises it alongside all of the other sort of great poems, Strange Meeting, Exposure, Fertility, etc. And it was worked on in his little attic room um, at Borage Lane when he's getting physically fit. And as he says, completely re resuscitated from shell shock. He wrote to his cousin, Leslie, in my, cham in my chambers, he does spell it like that, under the roof of a cottage, seven Borage Lane Ripon, I have written, I think, two poems, one in ode, which considering my tuneless tendencies may be called damn good, excuse me. What the ode was probably insensibility. We're not for sure. Um, and that there are alternatives to that. The other was the final version of Auteur or the send off. And at this time it was called the draft. So he could be talking about different poems here, but this was, as we all know, his kind of, place where he behaved in an owlish manner generally in this in this attic room revising and going through all of these manuscripts. Um, and so in this version, um, which he dedicates to Sassoon, um, we can see the beginnings of what became Auteur. Um, and I was going to read it out, but I think in the interest of time, I won't but encourage people to go and, and have a look at it. it. It is a fairly detailed version of what we later come on to. Some of the lines, and like I said, I haven't done the sort of um, uh, breakdown as much as, as Paul has, but you can see um, lines um, that will repeat in the later poem. Um, we grow legs as quick as lilac shoots um, do without what blood remained me from my wound. Um, there are the resonances here. Um, and in April 1917, he writes to his mother, my own mother, this afternoon I was retouching a photographic representation of a, of a dying um, an officer dying of wounds. And I think this is interesting because, you know, he says it's an officer. I think we can glean that from the way the speaker is speaking in this poem, um, that he isn't just a, a private soldier. He is, he is an officer. But the fact that he was calling it a photographic representation 
goes back to some of this, uh, the lore that he carried photographs with him um, or that he considered his poems to be photographs of what he was seeing. They weren't just, they were word photographs. And I think that's something we might want to discuss. But I'm gonna read this one out because um, it, it figures in what I'm gonna say in a bit. So he, he says, sit on the bed, I'm just a mass of shell. Don't touch me, can't shake hands now, never shall. My arms have mutinied against me, roots. My fingers fidget like 10 idle brats. I tried to pop out soldierly, no use. I'm dying of war like any old disease. This bandage feels like pennies on my eyes. My death won't cut much figure in your book. A short life and a merry one, my buck. We used to say we'd hate to live dead old, but now not to live seems, were you told how long I've got, et cetera. So this is him like, he's, this is how he's written it to her. So he sort of said, et cetera. He hasn't sent her the whole poem, but he's, he's repeating these lines, which eventually um, find their way into a tear. And one of the things that I, I thought I would throw out to discuss um, was why he changes the title, why he moves from Wild With All Regrets or as a sort of rereading of Tennyson's line, it's Tennyson's Wild With All Regret from Tears, Idle Tears. Um, and uh, the line, I don't think I've put this on a screen, no. Um, the line, dear is remembered kisses after death and sweet as those by hopeless fancy feigned on lips that are for others deep as love, deep as first love, and wild with all regret. O oh, death in life, the days that are no more. So he's taken that yes. from Tennyson. And he, why does he revise it then to um, a terre, which of course is the French word for ground, but also with its, with its connotations of the order of burial for the dead, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, etc. Um, so we can maybe think about that. Um, so this altered and expanded version was solidified in April, 1918. Um, and this was one of the seven poems that were eventually published in the 1918 edition of Wheels. Um, you can look at some of the facsimile pages of this on the British Library uh, website. Um, which is wonderful because you can turn the pages and, and sort of see their scanned version. Um, and I've mentioned the correspondence between Sitwell and Susan in my sort of first talk, but I did this time a year ago where she writes, Sitwell is writing to Susan about including the poems in Wheels 19, sorry, Wheels 1919, um, and that she wanted to dedicate the book to Owen and indeed they do that. And of course the Sitwells had approached Owen in 1918 to um, have their poems, to have some of his poems. And he has that one letter where he says, well, I need to check out what they do first before I know if I wanna be part of their book. Um, so she includes um, seven of these poems, including um, Ater. Now, it appears pretty much as it appears in the 1920 edition, save for the typesetting, which means that um, I haven't put the other page on here, but the scan is there. Um, so it, um, it actually goes over three pages in the wheels edition, um, whereas in the 1920 edition, it's, it's, it's on two pages. And that's how it looks. I've just sort of cut and pasted the two, the two pages. And what I wanted to do um, is read this edition because, and a, a bit um, backwards to what Paul just did, um, because I'm pretty sure you must have the Stallworthy edition or a later edition to follow along with. And so if you want to do that as I read, you might want to note some of the alternate, uh, some of the differences in it. Um, they're not as grand or as great, I think, as, as Paul pointed out in Conscious, but they're there nevertheless. Um, and certainly, um, the alterations in the line break or stanzas, I think, um, are quite interesting. So I'm going to read this. Ater, being the philosophy of many soldiers. Sit on the bed. I'm blind and three parts shell. Be careful. 
can't shake hands now, never shall. Both arms have mutinied against me, brutes. My fingers fidget like 10 idle brats. I tried to peg out soldierly, no use. One dies of war like any old disease. This bandage feels like pennies on my eyes. I have my medals, disc to make my eyes close. My glorious ribbons ripped from my own back in scarlet shreds. That's for your poetry book. A short life and a merry one, my brick. We used to say we'd hate to live dead old, yet now I'd willingly be puffy, bald, and patriotic. Buffers catch from boys, at least, the jokes hurled at them. I suppose I'd, I'd ever teach a son, but hitting, shooting, war, hunting, and all the arts of hurting. Well, that's what I learned, that and making money. Your 50 years ahead see none too many. Tell me how long I've got. God, for one year to help myself to nothing more than air. One spring, is one too good to spare, too long? Spring wind would work its own way to my lung and grow me legs as quick as lilac shoots. My servant's lamed, but listen how he shouts. When I'm lugged out, he'll still be good for that. Here in this mummy case, you know, I've thought how well I might have swept his floors forever. I'd ask no night off when the, when the bustle's over, enjoying the dirt, enjoying so the dirt. Who's prejudiced against a grimed hand when his own's quite dust? Live less than specks that in the sun shafts turn, less warm than dust, that mixes with arms tan. I'd love to be a sweep now, black as town, yes, or a muckman. Must I be his load? Oh, excuse me. I now can't read that because I've got a line there. Um, so, um, goodness me, that's my, um, I wanna get rid of my screen share. I need to hide. There it is. Okay. Pardon me. Um, oh, life, life, let me breathe. A dugout rat. Not worse than ours, the existence's rats lead. Nosing along at night down some safe vat, they'll find a shell proof home before they rot. Dead men may envy living, men, living mites and cheese or even or good germs, even. Microbes have their joys and subdivide and never come to death. Certainly flowers have the easiest time on earth. I shall be one with nature, herb and stone, Shelley would tell me. Shelley would be stunned. The dullest Tommy hugs that fancy now, pushing up daisies as their creed, you know. To grain go then my fat, to buds my sap, for all the usefulness there is in soap. Do you think the Bosch will ever stew man's soup? Someday, no doubt, if... Friend, be very sure I shall be better off with plants that share more peaceably the meadow and the shower. Soft rains will not touch me as they could touch once, and nothing but the sun shall make me wear. Your guns may crash around me, I'll not hear, or if I wince, I shall not know I wince. Don't take my poor soul's comfort for your jest. Soldiers may grow a soul when turned to fronds. But here's the thing, things best left at home with friends. My soul's a little grief grappling at your chest. To climb your throat on sobs, easily chased on other sighs and wiped by fresher winds. Carry my crying spirit till it's weaned to do what blood remained these wounds. So you will have noticed some significant changes if you were reading along in the Stallworthy edition. Forgive my rather halting um, recitation of that. But I think um, I, I love this poem for its many, um, it's got some of the best sort of O oh and one liners, I think. Um, um, much like in um, um, Spring Offensive and Disabled, 
um, they kind of really stick with you. But I wanted to point out some of the differences. Um, and this is one of those poems too, and I think we might want to, we could also discuss this as well, is why it's one of the last sort of anthology, not necessarily anthologized, but less discussed. When I was looking up things um, in thinking about critiques of this poem, it's not one that's often discussed, but I wanted to think about the differences. And this is where I kind of follow Paul's lead in his example here. Um, those of you that have, were reading along in the um, Stallworthy edition you know that um, he uses, um, um, if we look, hang on one second. Um, I've just lost my place. Um, where was that? It's up here. Yes, okay. So in, in the um, Sitwell edition, he uses my brick, but it's my buck. Um, that's the version that is printed. And in fact, that is the version that Owen writes. So is that a typo? Is that something that um, um, was read wrong or simply a typographical error? And another one is um, here, um, existences. In the Sitwell version that was printed, um, and it was indeed a line that I kind of um, flubbed over a bit because it doesn't really scan very well, not worse than ours, the existence's rats lead or led. Whereas here, um, we have um, not worse than ours, the lives rats lead. Um, and that is definitely what Owen writes. He's crossing out existences. And if we take what Paul said earlier regarding the fact that we, we can tell Owen's revisions, perhaps from, from other hands, by the fact that he crosses out these lines. And this is actually a, a, a very fair copy. This is the, the main copy of our tear. And you can see from these that, um, and I haven't put all the pages, there's about four pages, but they really aren't marked up in the same way that Conscious was, or indeed some of the other poems. So we do know that Owen was actually he didn't want existences. Why was existences kept? Um, I don't think it scans as well. But of course, even, um, even with these, um, I, so these are just some of the changes. And as I said, not, not as many controversial ones, but certainly ones that are, that are significant in that edition and which didn't make it in to the other editions. Um, but I also wanted to pick up on some of the resonances because, um, a lot of Owen's poems deal not so much um, with um, the action, but the aftermath. We get the action in Strange Meeting, but it's very much uh, about the aftermath. And that's certainly the case in, uh, in conscious, in disabled, and in mental cases. Um, and it really is about those, um, as we, we had sort of in the send off, those that march away singing um, have now crept back to a life of physical and psychic misery. And our tear, like mental cases, is a vivid portrayal of a living hell in which death would seem merciful. And unlike mental cases, which is written in the third person as someone observing the hellish patients, a tear is a dramatic monologue told from the point of view of a blinded and lamed officer, one who is uh, Sally Minogue and Andrew Palmer call very nearly dead. He's dying and indeed Owen says that in his letter. In the poem, the poem they assert in particular is an insight into the prospect of death. And of course it's laden with Owen's poetic voice, the use of pararime, which I'll come on to in a bit, this striking imagery that gives us those resonant lines. And of course, the language of his many influences. And I would say that while conscious has a kind of lulling with rhythm, a kind of quiet desperation, it's very melancholic, a tear is really jarring. Um, it's coruscating actually, as the speaker really rages against um, the easy acceptance of his fate, you know, so what if I have medals, who cares, who, what if I have uh, all sorts, you know, um, and so he turns this, this wonderful line 
about pennies on my eyes. He turns this custom of placing coins on the eyelids of a corpse to keep them closed into really, he turns it into an unmistakable image of the great war. The bandage feels like pennies on my eyes. I have my medals, discs to make my eyes close. But of course, if satire is here in the line, my glorious ribbons ripped from my own back in scarlet shreds, and that wonderful parenthetical sentence, that's for your poetry book, which is, you know, perhaps another, it could be even a dig at Sassoon, but it's certainly a dig at all of those sort of patriotic poems. It could be another dig, I suppose, at Jesse Pope and others. Um, but of course there's always pity. And that wonderful line, don't take my soul's poor comfort for your jest. Um, and of course being subtitled the philosophy of many soldiers, it explores various aspects of um, the soldier situation from the dying man's physical state to his plea for the reader's empathy. It runs the gamut, it explores his mental condition, his memories of the past and his longing to be made whole. That sense, I would even just be a muckraker, you know. Um, Ater is also full of allusions to those with whom Owen served his literary apprenticeship. And these are just some of them. We've got, of course, echoes of Sassoon in the lines we used to say we'd hate to live dead old, yet now I'd willy, willingly be puffy, bald, and patriotic, based to tales immediately. If I were fierce and bald and short of breath, I'd live with scarlet majors at the base and speed glum heroes up the line to death. You'd see me with my puffy, petulant face, etc. And in the lines, to grain then go my fat to buds my sap for all the usefulness there is in soap. Do you think the Bosch will ever stew man's soup? Someday, no doubt if, and echoes of the tombstone maker, one of, I suppose, Sassoon's perhaps more lesser known poems, I told him with a sympathetic grin that Germans boil dead soldiers down for fat. And of course, this is a reference to the famous lore that, that um, the Germans, the atrocity stories of the Germans, of, you know, boiling people down to, to make soap. Um, and then they're saying, do you think they'll ever make um, man soup? And I've put the, the line, the end of the lines here in, in bold, just to kind of point out one instance among many of um, the para rhyme at the half rhyme, sap, soap, and soup. And again, Palmer and Minogue draw our attention to this triple para rhyme. Um, and, and they talk about it as being something that um, goes from thought, from the consolingly metaphorical, which is in this sort of line here about your body naturally sort of turning and regenerating to this more gruesome and grotesque image of, of turning bodies into soap, into soup. And they argue that there might be regeneration, but it's, it's, it's not assured. We have Hausman um, in the line, your 50 years seem none too many, the line from um, mm -hmm. A Shropshire Lad, um, loveliest, of uh, loveliest of Trees. Um, we also have, of course, Shakespeare in the line, oh, life, life, let me breathe, a dugout rat, no worse than ours, the lives rats lead, um, which is um, echoes in King Lear. And of course, Shelley's Adonais, um, that's the big one uh, mentioned by name, of course. Um, um, I shall be one with nature, herb and stone, Shelley would tell me, Shelley would be stunned. I mean, it's a lovely sort of, yeah, he would be. This is how we talk though, pushing up daisies is their creed. So it's taking these, um, this sort of um, pantheistic vision Again, this is Palmer Minogue, who've, who've really done the kind of one of the most really interesting sustained um, critique of this poem. So I, I'm really drawing on their really interesting insights. They say that the pantheistic notion is reduced to the soldier's wry notion of death, where consolation of oneness with nature has been leached from the language. Really lovely way of saying it. Um, and it says all that remains of that unified vision, they argue, is in Owen's poem, is a kind of anticipatory 
prosopoeia, uh, Elizabeth Vanderbilt will um, correct my pronunciation, whereby the good is dead man is given a voice. Um, and in this wonderful final line, or one of the end lines, my soul's a little grief grappling your chest to climb your throat on sobs, easily chased on other sighs and wiped by fresher winds. Um, Palmer and Minogue uh, argue that here he exhibits his future dead self, but he sees only that he will have already become the grief another person can utter for him, and so recognizes that he will have no voice himself. This is a prosopoeia of the modern universe, recognizing that the voice of the dead will not be heard. And my argument here really is, is that this, I think is a rather unstudied poem, and I think has a lot in it that um, we can talk about. I, I haven't really gone in too much about half rhyme, but it's there um, all through that poem, subtly, um, not so subtly and absolutely reflecting this mood of the dramatic monologue and um, this inconclusive nature of, of these unanswered questions that these ghosts or near ghosts are, are showing us. And I think it's just another example of how no poet um, is more attuned to the physical and mental suffering of generation than Owen was. And I'll leave it there because I know we're um, after time, but I hope we can, people will be able to stay around for a bit more discussion. So I will leave that bit of my contribution out for you to mention. Thank you. Jane, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank right. you. Thank you. That was brilliant. That was superb. Mm -hmm. And it's a poem I've never given much yeah. thought to and will now do so much more. Um, something that struck me, and I'm, I'm just thinking on my feet, please forgive mm. me. Um, one of my earliest introductions to Owen and Sassoon was a, an anthology by, edited by Kenneth Allott called Contemporary Poetry, which was published, I think, in 1948. And Sassoon's two contributions were The Deathbed and The Child at the Window, which are both very romantic, smoothly flowing, elegiac poems, not at all what the sort of thing we associate with Sassoon. I wonder whether it, even in 1920, Sassoon was trying to smooth Owen over. This is a much more choppy, provocative, uneven poem, isn't it, than most of the Owen poems we associate with him. What do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, he hasn't done as much sort of, well, we don't know so much about the, because there are absolutely two versions. Um, mm. And and there, I think there's a much more, and for this one, I think um, there is more of a fair copy. So there wasn't as much revision. We knew that he had moved to, there was, you know, he knew that he had completed this new version of it. But I do think, I think it's the fact that you said it's sort of choppy and it's not like the Owen that we know. And That's yet right. he's there, right? Yes. The, the, the paradigm is there. Those wonderful lines of just complete, you know, they get you right in your gut. Um, but I don't know why it's not considered as much as, as I think it probably deserves to. Um, but I, yes. I, I, I don't know. One of the things that I, I haven't thought this through properly at all, because it's all only occurred to me this evening. Um, in 1948, people were still seeing Owen through Sassoon's lens. And Sassoon wanted to impose a particular version of Owen on them. I don't mean anything vicious here, just, just that he, that was his version of Owen. Yes. The, the elegiac, smoothly flowing version. And this one doesn't quite fit the pattern. No, absolutely not. And I think that's I think that's probably why people don't read it that much. But I think it has. Mm -hmm. I just think it's a facet. I mean, I haven't done that much work on it. But when I was doing stuff for the Cambridge History, it was one of the ones I tried to get to grips with a bit. And interestingly, there was a um, uh, a 
collection and I was sort of forced to look at this poem by this collection which was produced um, in Reading by um, a lot of sort of Reading artists who were taking um, uh, poems of Ohm and, and, and doing um, sort of um, their responses to the poems visually. And this, they use the title, the title of that collection is Pennies on My Eyes. Um, and so they'd asked me to write the afterwards. So I really had to look at this poem and I just thought it was so, it, was, it wasn't one that I had looked at in much detail. Um, so yeah, that, that's just, that was my observation. So I think it is, it's, I think because it is so unowen like I suppose. Yes. Yeah. Viv, Viv, you've read, raised a hand. Um, what one very mi minor point. I wondered whether that move from not worse than ours, the existence is rats lead. That is regular, isn't it? It's it's a pentameter, and it's as though he had the courage to think, I haven't got to do that. <laughs> I can write what I what's what is better. <laughs> uh, yeah. It yeah, because it, uh, because it starts out with couplets. They're not rhyming couplets, but but the, it kind of it's almost like. You could argue it breaks down, but then I, don't, I think you might be deliberately doing that. Yes, yes. And the other thing that I mean, I've always felt about this poem is that, you know, this your 50 years ahead seen none too many, um, that it really uh, tackles head on that kind of very common and popular motif during the war that to die young in battle was wonderful. You know, yes. how could you do better? When Julian Grenfell died, they all said that, didn't they? They all said, can you think of a better death? You know, uh, mm -hmm. and yes, yes. And what is it, you know, that um, line of, is it, um, is it Houseman? Um, um, it'll come to me in a minute about um, that it's, you know, is it so good to die? 50 years seem little room. Yeah. No, it's not that. There's another, wise, there's another. Lad, the, the wise lad to leave so soon, that one, to an athlete carried high. It could be, yes, yes, on. yes, I'll think about that one. But certainly it was very mm. common thinking, wasn't it? That Yes, yeah, so and also the fact young. that you had, I don't know what was the military age cut off as well. And also just the sort of thing, I wish I was your age. I mean, there would have been a lot like that. Yes, um, yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Mm. Jane, if I could jump in just for a quick moment, I think you just said it's not rhyming couplets, but it is para-rhymed couplets all the way through. So yes, I think- but it's the, in the couplet form, but that the lines change. Yeah, no, it's not rhyming couplets, but it's couplets. But, but it, it's para-rhyming couplets. Yeah. So it's his, his version of it. But yeah, I was struck as well by what Viv just said that not worse than ours, the existence is rats lead is iambic pentameter not worse than ours lives rats lead is short so mm -hmm. i i'm real i've never tried to actually trace this but i think it would be really interesting to look at where owen uses short lines and where he uses long lines in disabled there are several places where he has an extra i am and robert graves pointed that out to him in a rather um snippy letter saying <laughs> oh, you, 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 you can't just make up the metrical rules as you go along Owen, you have to work within the, within the rules. And yet Owen kept some of the, what Graves considered the extra feet and disabled. There are other places, so I can't think now of where, where he also has short lines. So I think that's something really, that would be a, something really worth looking at where, where he does that, where he disrupts the meter because he's absolutely a consummate metrician. Mm. So when he does something odd with the meter, he's doing it on purpose, I think. Yeah. Even in drafts. Yeah, I think, Jane, I think it is on purpose. Am I right, Jane? You, you showed that, that bit on the manuscript. Is that word lives not also a penciled insertion? Uh, let's see. I, I, I picked up as, as Vivian did that, that actually existence is, is metrically correct. Yeah. Um, and the, the, there you go. Yeah, that one, there, there it. Was. it looks penciled. That, that mm. is pencil, isn't it? Mm. But that's. 
Now, I mean, that's, what 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 would be sorry to interrupt? What what right. would be consistent with Owen's methods is that he he has, he tries various versions and crosses them all out and doesn't actually leave uncrossed out a completed version. There there are more than one poem where the editors have had to go back. I mean, Dulce is one of them where the editors had to go back and reinstate a deleted word in order to make the metrical pattern. Yes, yeah. I talked so about that. He or somebody has come back and, and added lives in pencil later on, which is not metrically complete in, in, in one sense, or maybe, as Elizabeth was, was suggesting, a deliberate attempt to disrupt the rhythm for, for a particular effect. Mm. The line that he's crossed out there originally, not worse than fighting men's the life rats lead. That's perfect. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then apparently he doesn't like that. Maybe it's too regular. Mm -hmm. And so not worse than ours, the existences rats lead mm -hmm. is also metrical if you do the elision between the yeah. and existences. And then the last one, not worse than ours, the lives rats lead is an I am short. So but of course, it's possible that he would not have stayed with that. We don't know. Yeah. Um, Viv had her hand up, and then Mar well, Martin first, and then Viv, because or does is yours Viv? Does yours follow on from this, or we'll go with Martin first because you yes, had your hand up. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, just a a quick one for Paul. Really, you said at the start about Mayflower being. Um, oh yes. Was it pink or something? You said, well. Um, I've always thought Mayflower as Blackthorn, so that's that's as when I've always gone on my walks as a kid, was told that the Blackthorn was was Mayflower. So, right. and that would be more consistent with because it's a white flower with a yellow centre, so yeah. that might be more consistent with him looking and think uh, the 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 subject mm -hmm. looking and seeing yellow flowers, mm -hmm. um, right. and also that would help. Um, maybe put the 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 um, situation, the events within a time frame within the year as well, which might be quite interesting. But I just thought I'd throw Could that I in. Could I come in on, on that one very briefly? Yes, sorry, go interrupt. Um, I was going to query that because um, Mayflower, as far as I'm concerned, means the hawthorn, and Shropshire notably has a most dazzling display of, of miles of hawthorn mm. in. May, June. I mean, I, I grew up knowing that, that May was Hawthorne. I thought well, that was in Shropshire. Um, and so that would have been a very familiar, um, but but not the, it, it doesn't come across as yellow. It comes across as, as, as sort of creamy coloured. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, even more than the, the Blackthorn, which is a, a sparser flower um, and simpler. But um, that's only a very trivial observation of, of the springs in, in the Shropshire hedgerows, which are, 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 are a delight when they are covered with it. Well, it, it, it's interesting, I think, because memories of home are mm. clearly or would clearly be significant mm. in, in terms of what's happening to the soldier in the poem. Mm. Uh, I, I was before you um, mentioned living in Shropshire, Helen, I was going to ask Martin where he was brought up, whether Mayflower was a regional name for um, Blackthorn. I mean, mm. when, when I looked it up, it, um, one reference said Hawthorne. Uh, as Mayflower, and I thought, well, yes, but that's near that's nearer white than yellow, so mm. I wasn't. Uh, mm. I mean, it doesn't matter in one sense. And neither of them is strictly yellow. No. No. Um. Anyway, yes. And he's he's actually quite emphatic. I mean, it's uh, is it Ken Sinbox on the in the um, poem yes. summaries on on the website says it's a sort of technical poem. You've got the blue sky, you've got the crimson slaughter, you've got the yellow yes. flowers. Um, so it, it's obviously part of his imagined yes yes um, whatever you like to call it um, set up there and ye yellow Mayflower there's a, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a synergy nice, with the sound uh, yep yeah, yeah very much so yeah Thomas did you want to come in quickly yeah um, I, I noticed on the E which we were talking about earlier for S Sassoon's um, declaration that in the second part of that note. He, he changes his E back to the more standard form of E, um, if that writing is by Sassoon. So uh, I am a soldier convinced in that these are um, a normal uh, type of E. And I was wondering if it would be possible to look at Wilfred's school books to see when he was educated in writing, 
um, whether he ever used that E uh, as part of his, his um, training. And therefore, you know, I, I, I know in my own experience, I was trained by somebody who was very um, uh, elderly. It was a, a teacher that was 60 years old when I was at infant school. And so the writing was something closer to Victorian writing and my writing changed um, along the way. So the, the way I would have written an E at that time would be different now today. So I just I wonder if it's worth just looking at um, his previous writing as a school child mm. to see if he ever had that kind of training and whether yeah, he could can, therefore possibly use both. There are images in the letter. Yeah, the letters too. So yeah, we could do that. It's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. I mean, to, just to counterbalance that, Thomas, I, I would say, well, Clearly, somebody has been tinkering with all sorts of other things in the poem for reasons which are not clear. Um, and where so soon, I, I would agree with you because I notice it too, but um, he does vary his formation. I don't recall Owen using that, certainly not in his 1917-18 poems. I don't know whether um, Jane could substantiate that from her reading of the letters, but... Uh, Anyway, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's unresolved, but it's an interesting point, I think. I was just going oh. to go. go on. Also, Sassoon produced, didn't he, a, a handwritten edition of his selected poems in the 20s, consciously beautifully written, <laughs> uh, which is something Wilfred never did for whatever reason. So Sassoon may have been adopting a kind of arty form of lettering, which doesn't necessarily tell us anything about anything else. No, no, quite right. Viv, did you want to come in there? No, it was just that those lines that I was stumbling over, well, life to be sure is nothing much to lose, but young men think it is, and we were young. young. Ah, yeah. oh, that's good, yeah, well done. Um, any other, I know we're over time, but is there anything else that people wanted to discuss or maybe why he, change the titles or no? Wilfred in, in, in his writing, he seems to join the B and the E in a different way to the, yeah. the B in particular. Though Sassoon does write Bs in the same way, but of course he did the, I think that, that E is, I think it's Sassoon. <laughs> <laughs> Are there observations from folks? These are a lot to sort of uh, yeah. take in, I think. I think we should have done these longer sessions, um, but that's nice because it means we're finding more stuff. Um, okay. Jane, well, I, can't be I can't believe how little I've thought about these two poems over the years. Yeah. You and Paul have really made me go back to them tonight. Yes, oh, absolutely. Great. And yeah. I think what, what is interesting because in the, in the Stallworthy edition and other editions, they don't follow one from the other. Whereas in the 1920, what's been interesting, the way we've kind of done this in sequence is to see that pairing, which is often very different. Mm -hmm. And to have these two poems, I, it'd be interesting to know what the mindset of someone reading these at the time in conjunction with the other, because they were clearly sort of paired yes. with an idea that they would follow on in some way and conscious is the quieter version of this one. And I think that's what's really fascinating. Be involved, both of you have been absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you Indeed. everyone for joining us. Um, I'll stop the recording now and um, come back in a second.